Okay. Well, I just. Um, oh my gosh. Oh, this is not one of those. Since, since um, we are approaching Halloween, I wanted to show you the scariest picture I've seen in a long time. So Prudential wants to consolidate, consolidate all the village farms for the benefit of investors so the village farms can feed the cities. A lot of money to be made there. So on that light note, we have our, our final panel. And I'm not going to introduce them, since you know who they are. And our interest here is to talk about how our panelists will talk something about their experience with the people. No, people want to sit and hear me breathe and wheeze. <laughs> I like the way you breathe and wheeze. You're good. All right, well, this has uh, just been an absolutely fabulous um, weekend, just fabulous. Before I uh, speak about what I'm supposed to speak about, I'm going to just really quickly say three things. One is I'm just so touched by the regenerative natural systems that we've been shown here, the wonderful stories of success. So it reminded me of the words of the great Gerard Manley Hopkins, the great romantic poet who said, and for all this nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. Isn't that gorgeous? Because <laughs> you, we, we took We've seen systems that look dead that came to life. Secondly, I just wanted to make a comment because in one of the earlier panels we talked about good things corporations are doing and I'm, I'm not going to argue if a corporation decides to do good things but I, I would just caution us not to put, not to trust the market to fix what's wrong here. Um, we uh, don't have all the good governments we, sh we ha should have but we have the right to good government. And Martin Luther King said, legislation may not change the heart, but it will restrict the heartless. Uh, it's just one of the better things that anybody ever said. Um, and finally, just before I turn to the topic, I do want to raise the issue of trade. We can't go into it here, but let me tell you, the trade agreements that exist, including NAFTA, the ones that are 3,200 bilateral agreements, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and the one being negotiated between the US and Europe right now, all contain what are called investor state agreements. And this gives foreign corporations the right to bypass your legal system and sue your government if it brings in any legislation that in any way hurts their bottom line. So it's a very important you know about this. I've just written a, a backgrounder for a very important report that we got a legal scholar in Canada to write if they come up with uh, an agreement, a serious agreement, when they're in Paris and all the governments come home and then they try to implement this, lowering greenhouse gas emissions, uh, sa saving water, protecting water, etc., they're going to be able to be sued for billions of dollars worth of compensation by corporations. You need to know this. It's not been part of the discussion here and it's an incredibly important part of it. So please go to our website to learn more about it. Go to Citizen Can a Trade Campaign here in the U.S. to learn more about it. It's it, uh, Citizen Trade Campaign here in the U.S. But go to our website, Canadians.org, for a brand new study. Uh, you'll see it right on our front page um, with a foreword by me and a, the, uh, the, the lawyer is named Gus Van Harten. And it has just, when we were knocked out on Friday, we heard that the European Parliament has adopted his carve out. He has, says we can write an agreement coming out of Paris that will protect us from these corporate challenges 
and we were knocked out. We heard the Greens were going to support it, and then the next thing we heard was that the whole European Parliament is adopted as part of its negotiating position. So I want to put that to you as a really exciting thing that a movement did. This is a, a whole trade justice movement you may not know anything about, but it's incredibly important parallel to the work that we're doing. So that leads me into what I'm supposed to be speaking about, which is, yes? Oh yeah, Food and Water Watch. I'm on the board of the wonderful Food and Water Watch here in the United States, and we have material out there. We would uh, really love for you to um, uh, look at the material. Um, Winona Howder, our executive director, wrote a wonderful book called Foodopoly on the c corporate control of food in the United States, and she's just finished a book called Frackopoly on fracking, which will be out very soon. Okay, so what I want to say in my few minutes is that I think we need to build our movement and what you're doing here, what we're doing here is so incredibly important in terms of challenging basically the baseline thinking about climate, um, the kind of uni unilateral way of thinking about climate, but I want to introduce the need for us to build movements that also include the whole social justice human rights um, aspect, which is what I came out of. I didn't come out of the science or environmental side of it, I, I, that grew on me and I learned a lot about it, but I came out of the human rights angle. And I just want to remind us that there's tremendous impact on people of everything that we've been hearing about here. And that impacts, again, what we're trying to do environmentally. Because when you displace small farmers and peasants and local people who have the local knowledge from the land, you're not only creating a huge human rights uh, problem, and then they're all moving to these uh, peri-urban slums that we were talking about, but you're also removing the people who know how to care for the land, who know how to dry land farm, who know how to, 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 to rotate the crops and all the things that we need to do. So there's a symbiosis there between caring about the people People and caring about the land. Um, similarly, there's a huge growing access to uh, lack of access to water as the, cri uh, the water crisis deepens. And it's impossible to ask a people who don't have sanitation to take good care of their river, right? I was in one uh, slum in, in uh, Kenya where they have what they call flying toilets, and that's where you defecate into a plastic bag and just throw it wherever. Uh, and believe me, there's no way to protect the river in that situation. So if we don't build a, a, a notion and a movement around human rights, we cannot possibly uh, think about how we're going to protect the environment at the same time. The whole issue of water scarcity is creating uh, more conflict between rich and poor, which is there's enough conflict in our world between rich and poor. And we've been talking about Sao Paulo several times, and I just want to say that there's one study that found that people earning a certain amount per month in Sao Paulo are receiving substantially less water than people making twice as much. So we have a situation where the more scarce water gets, the more power and control those who have money um, will have over over those decisions and often those people are people like Peter Brabick. I don't dislike many people in the world, but I can't stand a man named Peter Brabick. Peter Brabick was an ice cream salesman with Nestle in Switzerland became the president of Nestle, which is now the head of, what, 71 big bottled water companies around the world. He sells his pure life bottled water to poor people all over the world. He's also the most senior advisor to the World Bank on policy in the global south. And he promotes privatization of water. And of course, for the poor who can't buy it, there's always his pure life water, right? So we need to understand that there is a grab going on, a corporate grab. We talked about back about Brazil. The, 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 uh, the aquifers there are just being, there. there's a, a grab by the, the uh, sugar cane companies and the energy companies. They can see the writing on the wall about fossil fuels and they're all in there all over sugar cane ethanol and they're buying up land and they're buying up water. So the whole notion of the, the scarcity and the need, the, hum, the lack of human right at the other end is, is badly balanced by a, a corporate grab that I think we need to understand. Um, and finally, in terms of the, the impact, I think we need to understand that there's increased impact of, of water in many, many conflict zones. And I document these in my book, uh, Blue, uh, Blue, uh, Blue Future. 
but one I would just give you is Syria, where there was a massive drought in the north. Uh, people think it was just oh, a coincidental drought, but actually when Assad came to power, the, la the latest Assad came to power in 2000, he displaced millions of people from the land and basically deregulated the, the whole process of land management, displaced small farmers, millions of them, um, and gave, it to, gave the land to his cronies, and they were able to just access all the water they wanted in any way that they did. Um, and that created all these refugees, and this was a huge part of the, of the war. And we're now seeing water being used as a weapon of war in Syria, where they're turning off water supplies to the people in the south. So these are the human impacts, and it's really important that we find a way to, to, to bring these into the discussions that we're having here. Um, uh, Adam said, can we talk about a few successful campaigns? And I'll just um, briefly tell you uh, two that I've been involved in. One was the successful campaign to have the United Nations recognize the human right to water and sanitation. You would think that's a motherhood, but let me tell you, it was a huge fight. Um, I was honored to be asked to be a senior advisor, it was an unpaid position, to uh, the, the 63rd President of the United Nations General Assembly, uh, Father Miguel Descado Brockman, a wonderful theologian priest from Nicaragua. And he had read my first water book, Blue Gold, and he said, come and we'll work together and we'll do this thing. And a wonderful man named Pablo Sono, who was the ambassador from Bolivia to the United Nations, and we put a little team together and we just did it. And Pablo put in on July 28th, 2010, he just put the question to the United Nations uh, that, you know, yes or no, human right, water and sanitation are human rights. And everybody said, oh, take sanitation out. You know, you'll get water, but take sanitation out. And he said, it's sanitation, lack of sanitation that kills people. Uh, will not take it out. I'd rather lose a good res resolution than win something I had to compromise. And he said, anyway, I want to see which countries are going to say no, right, right there. So my country led the fight against, to my mortification, we're getting rid of those fuckers tomorrow. I <laughs> Excuse me. Pardon me. <laughs> Slipped out. All right, I feel better. Going home to vote tomorrow. <clears throat> So my, so my country led the fight against the human right to water. But when the vote came down and when they vote at the United Nations, they don't get up. Everybody sits at their, at their, their desk and they, it's electronic and it goes on a big board. Well, I was holding hands with some of my staff who were in tears because we were sure we were going to lose. We won. 122 countries voted in favor. Not one country voted against. 41 abstained, including the U.S., which has changed its position since, by the way. So it was an incredibly wonderful moment, and it didn't mean the next day everything was fine, but we have quite, I've got just written a five-year report on what, what this means. It'll be up on our site in about two or three weeks. Um, and it's, uh, it, there's been a lot that's happened, a lot of court cases. A number of countries have amended their constitutions to include the human rights to water and sanitation. There are success stories here to tell you about. The other fight that we've been involved in is trying to keep public water. Uh, uh, there's a place for the private sector in laying the pipes, but I believe deeply that water has to be delivered uh, on a, on, as a not-for-profit basis. And so we've had struggles as these companies like Violi and Suez or American Water here, um, come into communities and say, oh, it's a public-private partnership and you'll own the, you'll control everything, but we'll just do it because we're so efficient, which means that they raise the rates and they draw and they <laughs> and they cut corners and they cut the staff and the story is is incredible. We have a new report that tells us that we have fought so hard that we now have 185 cities around the world that went private and said that was a mistake and have remunicipalized, including, including 40 in France alone and Paris in the very country where these two major utilities come from. So it's been a real, it's been a, a fabulous success story that um, we're very excited about. And I would say also in the work that we heard from Michael and, and Jan and others around the, the recreation of water retentive landscapes is a wonderful opportunity to hire people, to hire local people, to hire people who may not have access to work. Um, that was one of the project, wonderful pieces of, of Michael Kravzik's project is that they hired a number of people, I think I believe a number of Roma people who 
um, had had work and the dignity of of of, of having having this work and this this pay um, for a prolonged period of time. So there's a real social benefit when we can think small and we can think local. Peter Glick, a water scientist, says the rural bank knows how to spend a billion dollars in one place, but they don't know how to spend a million dollars in a thousand places or a thousand dollars in a million places, which would be even better. So they don't think small, and we're when what we're talking about is local, and it doesn't turn the World Bank on, doesn't turn my friend Peter Glick on, but it turns us on, and this is the model. And I'm just going to end with one little story to tell you. This is a, a local fight in Canada. There's, um, you know, the Great Lakes. There's the Great Lakes. There's Superior and Michigan and Huron, and on Lake Huron, there's a Georgian Bay, a beautiful, beautiful place, and it's a, a rural community made up of all, <clears throat> uh, the, the county council is made up of the mayors of a bunch of small little villages because there's no city there. And it's all prime farmland. And there's an aquifer right on Georgian Bay and it's been tested to have some of the cleanest water in the world. So what do you do with the beautiful farmland and the nicest water in the world while well, you decide to put an industrial dump on it and sell access to the dump to industry all for, for, for miles and miles around. Well, the community fought and fought and fought for years. And finally, so I think it was four summers ago now, it came down to the wire. All the legal wrangling was gone. The county council was adamant. They were going ahead. It was called Site 41. And so the big trucks started coming in and building these massive, started to, they'd, they'd confiscated the land and they'd started building these massive cells to put, to, to dump the garbage in. So a local First Nations uh, community, the women of the, the First Nations, set up a, a, a sacred campfire and, they, and a peace camp. And every morning, so they would stay overnight, and every morning they would just happen to get up and hold a prayer vigil in front of the trucks as they came in. Just happen to stop the trucks morning after morning after morning for five weeks. Well, it's so cold in our, where we come from that you know ahead of time how long you have before the frost comes. So a certain point came and it was too late for the cell to be built that year. So the county council was furious. They started arresting these young women. They started arresting fa farm families. They arrested an 82-year-old farm woman, the, the, of, of, of farm couple, and she was baking butter tarts for the church bazaar when they, the police arrived at her place. And she used to be a teacher and she taught them the, the police officers, and she said, oh, boys, come in for a butter tart before you. We go off in the paddy wagon, right? So they did. Uh, and, of course, that gave us time to get the media there, because by now this was a David and Goliath story that was being watched all over the world, right? So we, uh, we got the media, and as she was being brought to the police car, she turned around, she said, I've never had so much as a parking ticket, but if I'm going down, I'm going down for water. And it was like, I knew we were going to win. So quickly, I know I have to end. We had, we finally got a, a, a vote. Yes or no, it was going to be an up or down vote. It was in August of that year. It was right in the county council building, which is kind of in the middle of a village in the middle of country, right? There were 2,000 people came to it. The balcony was as full as it could be. There were thousands of people outside. We had to set up speaker systems, and we just didn't know who was going to win. There were about a third for Site 41, and a third against Site 41, and a third in the middle. So, and it was raucous. It was wild democracy. People were throwing buns from the, <laughs> from the balcony. It was wild. So, I mean, this democracy gets real, right? So, um, so we had a woman, one of the mayors of these little towns got up and she put our side uh, out. She, she was wonderful. But there was a man, a great big guy, who was the mayor of a, a township called Tiny Township, a village called Tiny Township. I'm not making that up. And, and he used to be a quarterback. He was a huge guy and had been in business and was really rich and loved fighting protesters. He had the slogan, get up early, beat a protester. And he was like, tough, tough, tough guy. So we didn't know. We thought their speeches are going to are going to make the difference. That third in the middle is going to make a difference. I couldn't tell you which way it was going to go. Big tough guy, mayor of Tiny Township gets up to speak. You can hear a pin drop. Starts to cry. Starts to cry. Says, when I got up this morning, I was going to come in here and fight for Site 41, and I love fighting you guys. He went up to the balcony, right? He said, and then I went into my home office, and he said, my, my grandchildren had found one of the stop Site 41 signs put it on my desk and wrote the word Papa on it. In other words, Papa, you stop Site 41. And he said, in that moment, my job description changed. And I became a steward of 
the water of Simcoe County. And as long as I live, he said, Site 41 will never be built, and it never was. We won that fight. Today, this house uh, sowing the seed of hope. The Tom, Walter, Mikal, Jay, and continue sowing the seed of hope, this house. But you know, if we are sowing the seed of hope, so one thing if we always remember, you know, our greedy development, creating the real global problem of the climate change, and creating the complication in our lifestyle. So if we are not thinking about these complications and the complicated lifestyle and greedy development, so you do a lot of scientific things of the hydrological, uh, climatological. So we can't reach where we want, the reaching point we can't reach. So I think uh, now this, uh, this, this is not the house only have the seed of hope, but this globe have the lot of seed of the hope within the community. Where the community living and they can feel, yes, we can do something. Yes, they realize it. Yes, we can do. But they need some love and affection and respect of the knowledge system of the community. We are not giving the respect to them. When this today science and technology and engineering not giving the respect to them, so they feel, oh, oh this is more opportunist, more educated, more oh, super mind. The, that is the super mind. So this is the real complexity today the some good people and some very good people and some really very good people. You know, <laughs> this world, really, we have the five type of the people in this world today. Only 1% people who is the bother of the Tom and bother of my sister Maud Balo, they are not more than 1%. You can watch and you can monitor the only 1% people who is the real controlling our resource, our water, our common properties, they are really very much interested and they have the, no, they have the real super brain for the encroaching of the common property and the polluting our rivers and polluting our ocean and they have the real professional expertise way of exploitation of the resource they have. But they are not more than 1%. And the 1% like this, and the 4% is, they are really opportunist, who is every time helping them for 1%. So if you see this world, not more than 5% people who is really encroaching and polluting and the exploiting of the resource of this world. The rest of the 94% people in the community, they feel always better. Really, they are thinking about the better common future. But they are nothing doing for the better common future. They are thinking. And they have the beautiful brain. They are never thinking the exploitation and the complication and the uh, the pollution, they are never thinking. But this is the number of the people is 94%. Rest have the only 1%. And the 1% people divided in the three groups. Only the 0.07% people, they are, they have a beautiful brain and heart and hands. They are always ready for doing something on, on earth, on, on this globe. And when they feel, oh yes, this is the good, so they join and they start. But only the point, 0.07%. 
and the rest 3 percent. This is the only 0, 7 percent and rest only you have the 0.3 percent. The 0.3 percent pupil is divided in two. <laughs> the 1 percent <laughs> so the one percent is uh, the point one percent. They are always thinking about this. You understand what I am saying? You understand this point seven percent and the point two zero percent thinking about this. <laughs> Again, I am explaining. This is the real negative professional expertise they have, but the really negative about this art. Who is the encroacher and polluter? Oh, Tom saying the corporate. You can say any name. That not only the uh, company or corporation or the market. This is the exploitative market. There's some other thing also. But the only you include everything not more than 1%. And they are the 0.4%. They are really opportunist. This is the negative and this is the opportunist. So the rest to 0.02% bother about this. And the only 1% in this about bother about this. When they join this, so they little believe, oh yes, now the good people join. So they walk and they come in a movement. So that you create a movement and you, you get the so in the successful movement in this world. But when you join these forces, when they join these forces, the rest 94%, oh yes, this is a good pupil. We can go and we can join them. So they just start thinking and action something. But you know, the 2.02% you have here also. So he call this. And the opportunist join this. So your, your good pupil and this is the 94% pupil, they divide it. So you can't take the moment. What is common better future? You can't think about the uh, uh, augmentation of climate change or you are discussing a lot of things in the house, but you, you can't create the movement. So today, if we are really bothered about the better common future, so we can think in this world who have the 0.7% people, we are living, we are there existing, we are there doing. And we can start link with this and they can join this. And this is the opportunist not involved in the decision-making process. They can sit here and they can sit here and you can make like this. In my, in my country, I not know anything, uh, the mobilization of the pupil and, and uh, I not know the science of the conflict resolution about the water. I don't know. But I know this pupil and this pupil. And I joined them. And the moment to start. And we change the face of the earth. We rejuvenate the seven river. We regenerate the more than two and a half million wells in desert. So, I can say in the last, first we can think our lifestyle and our complicated way of life. And we can think about existing market and negative force about this one person. What is the way running this world? And where we can create a little bit wall against them. So now today the need of the wall against for this one person. And you have the strength 
94% with you. If really thinking, so now we can think about the Paris Summit. The Paris Summit is a, you know, in last uh, 35 years, in 72 in Stockholm and after that, a lot of uh, Earth Summit is going on. But we are not reaching anywhere. Because sometime we create an alternative forum in, in Johannesburg, you know. And, but we're not uh, sowing really seeds. We can try, we can show some seed of hope in this uh, Paris Summit. Yes, we are the last number. <laughs> we are the weak. Tom, I agree with you. Yes, the, the process is very hard and difficult. But you know, if we can push a kill, kill, you understand, in the process, so we can change the process. Thank you, Adam. Wow. Um, good morning. <laughs> so I'm going to go straight into showing and sharing how I reach out also to the bigger numbers, how we reach out to the communities. Uh, so that is me. I grew up in one of these communities. But one thing that I can tell you is that it's not easy to bring a program like restoration of grasslands to communities that have been acquainted or really aligned to getting easy food aid. And so you're competing with a lot of other NGOs that haven't been bringing sustainable answers or full answers to these communities. But growing up as a a young lady, I saw how the food aid was making us worse than better and how our land remained the same. And I determined to find answers and thankfully I met Alan Savory, the Savory uh, Center in Zimbabwe, and so the work began. When we started, really, we were sort of bringing knowledge it's easy to say, I know, I have knowledge, sit down, let me share, let me train, I'm going to write it down. And everybody's like, good idea. And we are like, so what are we going to do? Yes, we have to head our cattle, we have to heal our land, we have to get our water back. Everybody's like, we like it. <laughs> but are they going to do it? That's another story. <laughs> what does it take for them to do it? We didn't know because we thought we had done our best training, educating. We have this urgent information. But the mistake that we did, I was part of that mistake. I knew what the effects of climate change and changing rainfall patterns was, but I didn't, or we did not get that from the community. How is this affecting you? That's where you should start from, from where they are and what they know, what they used to live like, way before things went wrong. So that led us into, when I was still with the Africa Center for Holistic Management, developing a whole new holistic management curriculum for communities. This would help us even spread across Africa, across any region in the world, because it is based on local knowledges. Same principles of holistic management, but in my communities, the pressing issue is water and food security. Who wants to have no water? Who wants to have no food? What should we do to regain back our status and our dignity? So there was a lot of learning before we got to where that is. But anyway, let me share with you one of the stories. When we started, you know, you want to introduce a big project of huge herds of cattle management, 
and you want to build trust with communities so that you have 20, 50 households bringing their five head of cattle, 10 head of sheep into this one big land management herd. And the biggest question is, where do we get the water to water our heads? And so everyone's like, oh, we need water. And we are like, oh, so if we bring you water, are you going to put your cattle together? They're like, yes. So we had this nice agreement checklist. Are you going to bring your cattle together? Yes. Check. Are you going to continue crawling together or moving your heads together? Yes. Are you going to participate and pay herders? Yes. Oh, good. Yay. We bring our, wa our water. We, you know, we set infrastructure in place. But that's just in paper. It wasn't from their hearts. The water is there now. They are happy. They don't go heading. They don't do anything. Do you blame them? No. It didn't come from them that they needed water. It came from us that you need water to heal your land. So this game changed. Let's look at the game change. We started a whole new facilitation method that would let communities take total charge of the program, be in control. And it's not an easy process because it feels like you're literally being led by a community member. Yet you are burning with this knowledge and solution. But you have to find a place where they also agree that yes, this is a solution. Yes, we are in trouble. Yes, we can go back to a better life that we had. And so the first stage looks like, okay. So this, these two white uh, boxes here, how many minutes do I have? This is at organizational level or program team planning. Who goes to what community is totally and well planned? Because you have to know the culture, the ways of that community. I am a young lady from a community and I'm going to a group of men to talk to them about their livestock. They are cattle. I was like, little girl, what do you know? So I had to know how to be appropriate to a village leader, how to even buy his heart, to get to his heart, be his friend. And he trusts me with the whole community. So a lot of trust has to be built, but it starts by selecting appropriate people. And you start on the whole cycle. It's called the community action cycle. A lot of orientation happens there in that first level. Leadership buy-in is so important because they want to know if they can trust you with the people. And if a leader says no, then you can't access people. And in this case, I'm going to share with you that that's where you find a resonation with the communities the relationship of the current situation of the land and what they are going through. And they reach this desperate point of saying, oh my God, what do we do to get out of here? And then your stage is set. That's when you start sharing. There is hope. We can go from this level to that level. And you take them through the whole cycle, exploring why they got to where they were. Planning with them. Community action plans, what we call our strategic plans. Goals and things will be set. So let's go to the next slide. The way of teaching or the way of sharing knowledge is called the experiential learning cycle. How people learn. People learn by doing. People learn by processing what they've just learned. People learn by drawing conclusions of so what. And then what we have learned, how do we apply to our community? What does it take for us to apply what we have learned? Does it even apply? We use different methods of participatory learning. This is what we call a problem tree, which is really a cause and effect tool of saying the problem is bare land. Remember, as you address the bare land, you've built soils, you are taking in carbon, people have a healthy soil to plant their crops, all that comes in by addressing bare land. What are the root causes of these problems? These people come out with all this. And how is our life because of bare land? Those are the fruits of how the community is. You don't only stop at the problem tree. We are out for solutions. We get what we call the solution tree. The solution tree is what would our land have to be for us to have a good community? Healthy land. 
healthy and productive land. That's our trunk. What are the root solutions that we have to do for us to have the type of land and life that we desire? These are the root solutions. And what will our life be when we have done the root solutions? Flourishing people, happy people, happy livestock, happy wildlife, enough food, enough water for all of us. And that is the full diagram. We are here, we are going there. That's what motivates people. That is the community context of what they do. We do what we are doing because we want to go here to the solution. That's their driver. So in lessons as well, we do practical work. So these are just a few pictures. But we do mostly outdoor work, out on the land, reading land, what we've called eco-literacy. That is a very important man, a leader. And they are so supportive in most of the communities. They are taking leadership in just doing their grazing plans and mapping out their land. Powerful community groups for cropping, for grazing planning. Women are all in it, and men and young people. So these are just some heroes in the community. That lady right there, her name is Trinus. She warms my heart. This man, Matthew, is a leader in the project. And the lady called Balbina. They are some of our climate heroes that we have. And as an individual, my biggest dream right now is to continually promote these programs, but more than that, bring in entrepreneurial capabilities so that these guys get a lot more incentives from healing their land and they continue supporting their holistic management programs. Thank you. Thank you all. I think we have a few minutes for a couple of questions. Um, but they have to be down here because I'm tired of running up and down. No, just, <laughs> just kidding. Uh. Um, this question's kind of been building over the three panels. Um, and it starts with the question of wh um, what are the, the um, you know, going back to the idea of carbon credits or something like that for land re restoration. And what I'm hearing from a lot of people is that um, in a situation like in Rajasthan or in Zimbabwe, if you were to just offer people money, there's not very much that they can do with that money. But if you offer them, here's plants, here's water, here's you know protection from flooding and drought, et cetera, that the the reward is in is in the process as opposed to the reward is in some cash. And the other thing is about policy that if if it's if the money is coming from the government or from some agency, then, they have the right to say, this is how you're going to do it. And that, to me, sort of stifles the creative process of people really innovating. I understand capitalism can create some innovation, but it can also create a lot of problems with <laughs> in terms of motivation. So, <laughs> so, so I, I guess I'm just curious to hear from your perspective, having been working on the ground, about um, money coming um, from the government, for example, to, to say, if you can build carbon in the ground or if you can do this, we'll give you money, versus it just coming from the people, so. I would say that I think any greatest incentive is for people to know why they want to put carbon underground. And money can then come to support those initiatives. But if they don't reason it, they can work as long as there's money and once the money finishes, they abandon the project. But when they know why they are doing it, it's for their future, their families, and their lives. Even if money didn't come in, right now we're in a very difficult economic situation in Zimbabwe. Most of the programs have had to scale down, but the communities haven't died. They are still there and going because they know why they are doing it. I think money is really create a problem within the community. When you are putting and giving the money, so you broken the system of the community. If you rely to the community, yes, we can do something. And when they feel the need of community, yes, need some help because we not have this. And that community decision they can take. You know what is the way um, in, the, in my community, they have, when they start the work, they have no money. 
but they explore the people who can support us and that community what is the link with our my community so who is the migrate before to the cities so my community go with them because they have the emotional attachment with this land with this water with this rains and they give the money and they feeling of the sense of ownership and belongingness so that type of the community support is a different character if you are giving the money you really destroy to the community yeah. system question up in the heights thank you so much uh, such brilliant ideas you've all given us and we're grateful return to shayab i want to ask you a question you spoke about how research frequently is high and flying in the clouds and not getting down to the ground and yet what you've created through vision and your humility and belief in the people needs perhaps an activist research network that can we're coming from the communities the right questions the problem setting and the linking to the solution tree that precious spoke about so eloquently maybe that's the next step because we want rajasthan and all of the surrounding states to benefit from this indeed the dry land agriculture and water issues in, in, if you look at sub saharan africa in india that's over a billion people who are not being served by modern science very well is there something in terms of activist research that a great university like this and some of the universities in india could combine and then work with africa in similar ways for common solutions to common problems Next question. Um, I just want to say that just about everybody in the audience is qualified to be a speaker. They just don't happen to be a speaker on this agenda. So when I say next question, I mean you got a minute or two to ask a question or say whatever you think should be said. Well, thank you. Um, I'm Barbara Passero from Meadowscaping for Biodiversity, and we have an education program to bring students outside so they can work on some subject themselves and see how you rebuild the environment. But I, I really fear for this country. There's too much money in this country and the money, people don't care about the environment. People really don't care. There's, there's how many of us here? And there might be, a, you know, there's more. But how, if I can't get into the schools, I can't get my program into the schools, how can I bring my program to the people? If I can't get into the newspapers because I don't have, I'm not talking about a movie star. <laughs> I mean, how can you get to the American people when they're always on their cell phones or their iPads? Their minds are gone. American people's minds are gone. How do you get to Americans? I can see how you can get to people in other countries because their minds are not gone. <laughs> but, but, but I'm trying to get into well, yeah, well, Didi, Didi told us about this yesterday, and there are two young ladies here who are leaders and Jim's crew of homeschoolers. Um, but I haven't gotten well, I, I, I think it's it's many ways a ground, ground up thing, but we have people working on it. and. Uh, yeah, thank you, Glenn. And there is a, a sea change in the past year. Let's have one more. Well, this, this <laughs> uh, it, you, uh, Right? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. It works. Um, I was going to say this before when I was on stage. We have a real problem around the world and especially in developed countries. 
is that we've lost our spirit. Now, the Pope alluded to this, and you had a um, agricultural scientist in the Dust Bowl days called Charles Kellogg, and he saw it, and he quoted, that the demise of the land follows, it doesn't precede the demise of the people. And then the Pope said, before we can fix this planet, we've got to fix ourselves. So you've all been talking about that. And, um, and the people that are still spiritual, like your people you're dealing with in Africa and India, they have far more hope of fixing the land because they're already halfway there. But our system we have in these Western democracies <laughs> preclude a lot of that. So we do really need to look into ourselves to fix the land. Um, I, I agree with you, Tom. But on behalf of Homo Modernus and our, our, particularly in the progressive end of the political world, our predilection for mea culpas, I want to say that we're all earthlings. We're not perfect. We're learning. There's a lot of great stuff going on. There's a lot of noise from, from the money sector, but um, we, we, are move, we are moving on, and I think we should kind of love ourselves along the way. Thank you so much. I think I've heard a lot about the importance of connecting people to the land, and there's a lot of land around. In 1889, a famous Irish poet uh, gave me the material to close this session. William Butler Yeats wrote The Lake Isle of Innisfree. I will arise and go now and go to Innisfree, and a small cabin build there of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honeybee and live alone in the bee-loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. There, midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always, night and day, I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore while I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's gray. I hear it in the deep heart's core. Bring someone you know who doesn't go outside very much to the outside for half an hour and it will make a big difference wherever, whatever land you are on. Thank you. A, an elegant close to the morning. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, where are the workshops posted? They're going to be up here on the screen. Could you put they, them on the screen? Okay, they're on the table out there, and they will be on the screen. And well, so we're going to start at 1.15, and there will be three one-hour workshop slots. And Lacey has a brief but very important announcement. Right. Okay. So I don't know about you guys, but I feel very inspired right now. Who's with me? Yeah? Okay. Well, there's been, you know, you left us with a really nice message there about asking people um, to come outside with you for a little while. And I'd like to ask all of you to pay it forward in a similar way, in multiple ways. First of all, if you've been inspired by what you've heard this weekend, I implore you to go out, share photos and comments on Facebook or Twitter. Tell people what you've learned here and really just spread the word. Uh, another thing, a humble request. As a pioneering but small nonprofit with a big vision, financial support is a vital resource that allows us to continue bringing our message of climate hope to new audiences. And you can become a catalyst for this important paradigm shift by helping us mobilize the next generation of climate leaders. 
We're asking you to please consider making a tax-deductible contribution today. Our lovely volunteers, Helen and Claris, will be at the registration table to receive um, gifts of cash or checks made payable to Biodiversity for Livable Climate. You can also go online and make a contribution at bioforclimate.org slash donate. And a final thing, if you're interested in collaborating with us, connecting us with potential partners or supporters or volunteering to offer your skills as part of our core team, please come and talk to us during the lunch hour. And that's it. Enjoy lunch.